one. Okay. Um, how many of you had a chance to watch the video I put in for this week? Um, it was the case study. Yep. Yes. I saw I really it. think I want to put a case study in every week so you can watch it to give you not give you a bigger picture of things. Uh, because we throw all this information at you and you're reading all this stuff and you're just trying to make some sense of it. So uh, this week, uh, we're going to do quiz two to start with, right? And um, and then we're going to talk about pregnancy. So you know pregnancy is divided up into three trimesters. Antepartum is during the pregnancy. Intrapartum is labor and delivery. Postpartum. And then um, we'll have some um, high-risk things. Uh, that will then uh, pull in. Okay. Jeremiah got his fixed. So um, like I explained earlier, when just a few people were here, for the quizzes, you don't need a second device. For the exams, you will need a second device because you can be uh, on Zoom and on Canvas at the same time on your computer. I think I just heard you say quiz two. Quiz this week, quiz one, week two. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. And then, uh, but for your exams, you uh, exam soft won't allow you to be on Zoom. That's why you'll need a device uh, for Zoom for exam week. And I know I'll have to repeat that several times. It's okay. Did anybody remember anything at all I said last week? See, remember when I was talking to you and said most people are not auditory learners and you don't remember um, more than a quarter of what I spoke about last week. Uh, that's why, you know, taking notes and stuff is very important. So I hope you brought some paper and a pencil to take notes today. Um, I've got, you have in Canvas, you have all kinds of PowerPoints and documents and stuff to look at. And this morning I added um, a list of OB medications for you to begin to make drug cards or however you wanna do it. And also um, some tea sheets. They're just pictures um, to help you remember some things. Uh, sometimes just taking a picture and writing notes on it will help you, okay? So whatever I can do to help, please, please, please don't don't um, hesitate to reach out. Now, last week, one of my classes um, that was usually on Friday uh, was dissolved and those students were put in other classes. And some of you today were in the Friday class before, right? Is anybody here? I think Stina, I think some of you were in, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's kind of nice because you, a little bit more consistency there, but then there was a problem with, getting your homework re resubmitted. But I think I have everybody's now. Um, anybody not do their OB calc? You don't need to raise your hand. Um, if you didn't do your OB calculations uh, from that was due Sunday, please do that. Uh, because we need for you to know how to do those kind of problems. Um, you'll have those kind of problems on the exam. So if I, um, uh, submitted a grade and it was low, make sure you look in the comments. I gave you some guidance and some just some suggestions, uh, offer tutoring, and then a video that you can watch to help you do those calculations. So don't hesitate to reach out even if none of that works. Or you just want to meet me on Zoom and we can work on them together. Okay. For your next OB calculation, I don't think it's due until week five. Um, it, you won't have these opportunities. I mean, you won't have an opportunity to correct before you submit. So um, you can, however, send them to me as you do them if you want to make sure they're right, okay? It's a little bit different, okay? Not much, but a little bit, okay? Because my goal isn't to just tell you what the answer is. I want you to be able to calculate, to set up, how to set up that, 
uh, problem to in order to perform the calculations. Okay. Okay, Shayla. Another bad storm. Is that Port St. Lucie? Storming down your way? Okay. Yeah. Norfolk. I'm not hearing very well. I don't know whether it's me or it's... Let's see. Maybe that works. Somebody talk. Hey. Hey, Dr. Zeller. <laughs> it's still not very loud. Is oh, that? Wait a there we go. I fixed it. See? I, I sent you a message saying that there was a storm here in Norfolk, and I said my internet might be a little spotty. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Norfolk, I, was about huh? to say, I was about to say, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. All right. Everybody ready to take the quiz? All right. So um, you will have to go to your Canvas in Module 2. Now, if you don't start the quiz right away, you're going to slow everybody else up. It'll be that much longer that you'll take for your quiz. So get started on it. So your access code for your quiz is um, the word ACE. Where are you? And that's uppercase, A-C-E. I put it in the chat, A-C-E. Go ahead and start your quiz. A-C-E, and stay muted, please. When you're finished, just turn your camera off. That, that way uh, you let, let us know you're done. That code doesn't work for me. Are you using uppercases? Uppercase A-C-E? Capital A-C-E. Okay, let me try.
one simple hearing hack anyone can use to get rid of tinnitus in less than 24 hours. You may not know this, but the biological reason why some people struggle with ringing, buzzing, and swishing sounds known what we were talking about, what we'll be talking about today. And the rest of them were from last week. So if you didn't make at least a seven or better, then you need to ask for help or you need to think about uh, how maybe you could have prepared better. Uh, maybe you didn't look at the PowerPoints, whatever. I, I do want to go over the quiz with you. Uh, but uh, for the most part, um, congratulations for getting through your first quiz, okay? Uh, if you want to go over with me, anybody, um, I can do that after class today uh, if you want to do that. Oh, actually, I can't do it today. Do you know what I'm doing today after class? I'm teaching another class. 
just like it. Okay. For uh, Dr. Roberts' class tonight, um, she's on vacation, so I'm teaching her class. So I'll, I'll be glad to meet with you another time. Okay. So this week we're talking about the antepartum period. Okay. And the antepartum uh, period is the first um, 40 weeks of pregnancy, right? Then we go into the postpartum. So what we talk about is initially what's going on in the mother's body to prepare it to grow a fetus, okay? Uh, a lot of changes occurring in all systems. So it, it's occurring so that she can support another living being. And then uh, we need to talk about the beginning, the, the conception. And so from a fetal um, aspect, you know, what's going on with a early pregnancy? How does that happen? And what are some milestones along the way? Don't memorize embryology, okay? Do not memorize embryology. Do not memorize anything about genetics. Only what we discussed today is really important, okay? And then we're going to talk about some testing that we do in that first prenatal visit. And then what we can do also, or, you know, during later in the pregnancy for our high risk clients, uh, our clients have diabetes or an adolescent who has a baby that's not growing well, or uh, someone with uh, an abnormal fetus. Uh, anything like that, that we need to really watch closely, monitor them more often, have them come to the office during the prenatal period and make plans for delivery. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you is a video I did put um, in the PowerPoint, one of the PowerPoint slides uh, that I'm going to show you today. And I just want to share, you're not going to be able to hear anything, but you'll be able to see it and watch it. And I'm going to interrupt. It's only like four minutes long. I'm going to interrupt it. But the purpose of what I want you to see in this video is the picture of the blood flow through the uterus. Um, and then it, how it flows to the, the fetus. And this is so important in pregnancy to understand the, the, the blood flow that needs to be occurring uh, for our fetus. So let me just get this started. So we have the inferior vena cava that's bringing blood away from the uterus, right? Back to the heart, the lungs. We have the aorta and the iliac arteries that are bringing the freshly oxygenated blood with lots of nutrition to the uterus, okay? So I'm just going to turn this on. I don't know if any of you taken time to watch it. And so they just kind of go through the anatomy a little bit in, in the iliac vein, um, the uterine artery, uh, and then the uterine artery feeds the uterus. And then within that, and, and this shows the, just the oxygenated blood headed to the uterus. Of course, it's feeding the lower half of the body too. And the placenta. So the portion of the uterus where the placenta is attached is called the decidua. And so the blood flows into the decidua and around the uterine uterus itself. Okay, and then the, uh, the deoxygenated blood returns to the placenta from the fetus via the, uh, and then the uterus. Right here is a depiction, let me pause it, a, a cutout of the placenta. On the bottom part here, where these squiggly lines are, that's the uterine portion. Okay, and this upper upper part here is the umbilical cord. So you can see that the blood is not mixing; it's just interlaced, and the blood blood vessels from the mother are really close to the fetal uh, blood vessels, so that gas exchange can occur and nutrients can be pushed over to the fetus.
So you can see how it's transferred. It's not a direct, they don't connect, but they're very close so that all that good stuff can go through the umbilical vein to the uterus. I mean, I'm sorry, to the fetus and comes back through the two umbilical arteries. And that area right there where the placenta and the uterus meet is critical. That exchange is very important. And we have to uh, position our mother and talk also talk about what will reduce this blood flow? What reduces the pressure? We need good blood flow in this area of the of the of the uterus, and it goes into more detail here that you don't really need to know. I mean, it's good, but and you can watch it on your own time. So the the blood vessels are are full of blood, and they're relaxed. So that that system of exchange right there on the placenta is a low pressure system so that there's a plenty of blood available. It's a low pressure system. This is the baby's heartbeat. It's kind of neat to watch. Five words you pronounce wrong two years before you break. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I found that video just last week, so I thought it was really good. I've been looking for something like that because um, I really stress this this week of class because we're going to talk about uh, the system changes next, okay? So let me pull up a PowerPoint. So let's talk about the mother first. What is going on with our mother? Start shutting down. Demen Okay. Can you see my screen? Maybe, maybe not. No, we can't see your screen. Okay. There we go. That better? Yes. All right. So we're going to look at each system briefly. So what do I mean by a system? The respiratory system, the cardiac system, integumentary system, um, and all these things, like I said, change so that we can support a growing pregnancy. And most of the changes are caused by Hormones, okay, progesterone, estrogen, uh, the human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, uh, all of these help change the uterus and the breast to prepare for a baby, okay? So the breast, as you can imagine, progesterone and estrogen enlarge in the breast, and, and the breast uh, the lactiferous lobes are beginning to develop right away. Those are the lobes that help manufacture milk. So all that is changing. Um, the memory lobes is what I was talking about. The, there are skin changes during pregnancy. In the breasts themselves, you might actually see blood vessels, and particularly the veins, that become more prominent during pregnancy. The development of stretch marks. Um, the darkened areola uh, around the, the nipples. Um, colostrum is being manufactured already. Okay, so 
progesterone and estrogen cause these changes. The uterus enlarges. The first few weeks of pregnancy before the 12th week, it's still way down in the pelvic cavity. We can't palpate it yet. Um, estrogen and progesterone causes it to grow. The uterus actually grows in size, not because it's growing for a pregnancy, but there's more cells added to the uterus. So once the pregnancy is over, it's never the same size as what it was before the pregnancy. Okay. More blood vessels. As you can see from our video that we need a lot more blood vessels and we need a lot more red blood cells and we need a lot more blood to support the uterus and the fetus. Okay. The blood vessels um, are a little more um, uh, fragile even during pregnancy because there's less pressure in them. Um, so once that uterus is grown beyond the 12th week, it now becomes an abdominal organ because it's getting bigger. And we can begin to palpate it at around 12 to 14 weeks. We should be able to feel the fundus, the very top of the uterus. The uterus is more relaxed um, during pregnancy, less contractility. Okay, and that's progesterone again. And another hormone called relaxin. Okay. And the cervix and the vagina are also increased blood flow. So sometimes we'll see some a bluish tint to those tissues because of increased vascularity. Okay. They're engorged almost and they're uh, they're friable. What's friable mean? Anybody know what friable means? It's easier to bleed. So if you if you go in and do a pap smear when someone's pregnant, you actually might cause some bleeding. Okay. Varicosity, varicose veins are veins that are engorged, right? Like you can have leg varicosities. So during pregnancy, those things can get worse, okay, because of the extra pooling and the extra blood. So some women even have vulvar varicosities that can be very painful. Okay, hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoid is a varicosity. It's an eng engorged rectal vein. Okay, so all of those things become more pronounced during pregnancy. Um, a woman produces more white blood cells during pregnancy. It'll be in her urine. It'll be in her vaginal uh, fluids. It'll also be in her blood, okay? The va vagina has a decreased pH. And usually this allows for increased um, candidiasis or yeast infections are more prominent during pregnancy. And if you have a diabetic, she's a more prone to infections in pregnancy. She's already prone because she's a diabetic. During pregnancy, it's even worse. So you, now you know one reason why a diabetic is a high-risk client. Okay. The skin changes. Um, this is progesterone again. Um, you'll have different, your, the birthmarks a woman has become more prominent. Uh, she also might develop a facial mask. It's called melasma or chalasma. It means the same thing. Um, striae gravidarum. Who knows what a striae gravidarum is? Stretch mark. Stretch, stretch mark. marks. Yeah, stretch marks. So anywhere where a mother gains a lot of weight, is it could develop a stretch mark. We think mainly of the abdomen and the lower abdomen in particular, but she might have stretch marks on her breast, on her thigh, on her arms, if she has excessive weight gain, okay? Linea nigra is that there's a dark line that develops uh, midline of the belly, okay? It's called linea nigra. Uh, uh, nevi, which are freckles and moles, they get larger in pregnancy. Um, palmar erythema. Well, here's the palm, right, of the hand. 
So what does Palmer erythema mean? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Is it sweaty hand? Sweaty hand? <clears throat> What's erythema? What's erythema? Is it like red patches or swelling in the hands? Oh, it's it's a redness of the palms. They get more red because of more blood. Okay. And then acne. Acne could get better during pregnancy. I mean, it could improve. Uh, but I've seen it the opposite too. But some sometimes um, acne will develop. So in this list, which one is permanent? There's only one. There's that's permanent. Permanent. There's more. There's more. The stretch marks because they're actually pulling the skin apart, right? Yeah. Everything else should fade and return back to pre-pregnancy condition. Okay. And then the, the endocrine changes. And you can really get caught up in this. Don't get caught up in this, okay? But um, HCG is a human chorionic gonadotropin. And where do we know that from? HCG. What is the HCG? Do we know we're, it what we're talking about? Found in the pregnant woman's urine? Yeah, yeah, it's it's the pregnancy test that you can do with putting urine on on a on urine drops on the test. Uh, it's a pregnancy test, and it will reveal two lines if there's HCG in in the urine. Okay, so it's one of the first biological markers of pregnancy is the HCG. So it occurs in the urine and the blood about the same time. Okay. Um, so progesterone, once again, reduces contractility. Progesterone also makes that uh, endometrium, the area where the, um, uh, the placenta attaches, where the embryo is, it's, it, that is where um, uh, it builds up the blood supply, you might say. So it makes it nice and cushiony, full of blood. Okay and blood vessel relaxation. And that's blood vessels throughout the whole body, not just the uterus. And then estrogen, it helps with the breast uh, lactiferous ducts, blood vessel growth throughout the body. Um, sometimes women experience some nosebleeds during pregnancy because of the congestion of the blood vessels in the nose. Uh, they, she might have some congestion and have a nosebleed Okay, all those blood vessels are dilated. Gum, uh, bleeding gums is not un unusual. It's really important for a woman to see her dentist during her pregnancy because she's more prone to dental cavities, dent, uh, um, a gum disease, and that can lead to early labor. Um, and then prolactin is another hormone that begins to rise during the pregnancy and goes up higher during the last part of the pregnancy. And prolactin is the hormone that, that stimulates milk production in the breast. We'll be, go over, we'll be going over those hormones again throughout the quarter. And so you heard me talking about blood volume and red blood cells. The cardiovascular and the hemopoietic um, systems uh, change a lot. So we have a lot more red blood cells produced because we need the mother to be able to carry as much oxygen as possible on those red blood cells, okay? So the total blood volume, so this would be the red blood cells and the plasma together increases by 40 to 50%. So if you have five liters of blood in your body, when you're not pregnant, when a woman's not pregnant, she could have as much as seven or eight liters by the time she gets to the end of her pregnancy. Plasma actually grows more than the red blood, vessel, blood vessels, okay? So there's a little bit of dilution of the red blood cells. Cardi because we have a lot more blood and the heart rate goes up, we have a greater cardiac output, right? 
you know that the heart rate times the blood volume or the stroke volume equals cardiac output. In other words, the heart is working a lot harder during pregnancy. So more oxygen consumption is needed, okay? However, the blood pressure, there's not much change to the blood pressure. Even though there's a lot more blood volume and the heart rate is up, the blood is, is relaxed in those out other systems, right? So around the uterus, around the lower extremities, there's more blood pooling. There's decreased system, systematic or uh, systemic vascular resistance. So the blood pressure pretty much stays the same. It might be a little lower in the first trimester. Okay. Um, also, remember our video we watched? How the baby was uh, lying on the mother's back? If mother was supine, right? We have what we call an AOR, uh, aortic caval syndrome or supine hypotension. When mother lays on her back, it compresses the vena cava and the aorta. So that reduces blood flow to the placenta. So if I go back to that video, you remember the blood flow was coming through the vena cava in the aorta and circling around and perfusing the uterus. If she lies on that with her um, large uterus, her large baby and all that amniotic fluid, the weight of that pregnancy could actually compress the vena cava in particular. And so what happens if the blood flow to the uterus is reduced? What does that mean? Reduce nutrients to the fetus. Yeah, it reduces blood flow to the fetus. It reduces the oxygenated blood, the blood that has the nutrients in it, right? So that's a problem. We don't want that to happen. It actually decreases her cardiac output by as much as 30%. Uh, mother is more prone to um, blood clots in her lower extremities during pregnancy because of the excess blood and because of the pooling of the blood. And also because the coagulation system is more active. Okay, so she's more prone to develop clots. The heart is larger during pregnancy. It's a little hypertrophied. It's actually moved, um, I think, in this direction. I can't remember which direction it's moved to because it's bigger. So the uh, PMI has changed. Um, physiological anemia. Remember, I was talking about the volume of plasma is greater than the volume of red blood cells. So if I took a glass of water, as a, for example, and put some marbles in it, or let me put it there, something that floats in it, okay, and it'll be distributed, right, evenly. If I add more water, it looks like I have a lot less red blood cells. So it's more diluted. Okay. So it's not uncommon for a woman to look like she's anemic during pregnancy uh, by labs. But if she has an, a hemoglobin of 11 or less, we're, we're going to keep an eye on her. Okay. Or a, a hematocrit of 33 or less. The fibrinogen is the coagulation system. Okay, that's what makes clots. So that system is more active. It, it's, it has more um, protein in that area. Okay. And then the pulmonary system, the respiratory system. The only thing that changes in the respiratory system is the tidal volume. In other words, she's breathing in more air. She's not breathing faster. She's just breathing in more air. So she's a little hyperventilated in the fact that she's bringing the tidal volume, the volume of air inspiration and expiration is greater. She might experience some shortness of breath, especially later in her pregnancy. She's using more oxygen. That's what it means by consumption, 
increase oxygen consumption. The GI system during pregnancy, it just slows down. Just that uh, peristalsis, those muscular movements of the esophagus, the movement of emptying the, the stomach, and then the testes, all of that slows down. So she's more prone to nausea, vomiting, um, pyrosis, which is heartburn. Uh, there's less um, uh, acid, but that food tends to sit there in the stomach a little bit longer, more prone to reflux. Um, her her um, liver slows down in moving the bile to the gallbladder. Um, so we could, a client can ex experience some what's called cholestasis, and that could make her uh, sick, okay? Um, bile retention. And when that begins to occur, her bile um, acid level goes up and she begins to itch. The only resolve to that is delivering the baby. And then uh, constipation, okay? Um, she can also develop uh, gallstones easier. Uh, it's it's not unco uncommon for a woman after a pregnancy or even during the pregnancy to need gallbladder surgery to get rid of some gallbladder stones or the gallbladder itself becomes inflamed. The kidneys actually uh, expand a little bit. The ureters, the tubes that, that draw the urine into the bladder, they actually dilate. But the kit, the urine tends to just kind of get hung up in it because they become more tortuous. So there's some urine stasis in the ureter, and so she's more prone to urinary tract infections during pregnancy. We do not give diuretics during pregnancy. Okay, kidneys are already working hard. The rate of uh, filtration that that nephron. Uh, does increases the glomerular filtration rate the gfr increases significantly because of the all the extra blood musculoskeletal changes uh, progesterone and relaxin both are hormones that cause relaxation of ligaments okay if you think about where all the ligaments are in the body the ligaments are what connect bone to bone right Plus, there's other ligaments. Uterus has three sets of ligaments. So all those things relax a little bit. Um, that allows the uterus to grow. Um, but it can cause some back pain, some posture changes like lordosis, um, sharp abdominal pains, like a lightning shoots up. Um, the center of gravity is changed because of the growing. So those are the musculoskeletal changes. So sometimes a woman can have back pain even if she's only 18 weeks pregnant. And it's not that her baby is so large, it's, it's that progesterone and all those relaxed joints. And that allows also for the birth of the baby. The thyroid um, grows, becomes hypertrophied a little bit during pregnancy to allow for adequate thyroxine for a, for a fetus, an embryo in particular. Um, if mother has low thyroid levels uh, when she gets pregnant, her baby could actually suffer neurological uh, damage uh, without adequate amount of thyroid. Okay, so really important concept here. Fetal oxygenation is dependent upon blood flow from the uterus to the placenta and to those umbilical vessels. So what reduces maternal blood flow to the uterus? Compression. Position. I'm sorry? Compression. Okay, so supine hypotension. Okay, we'll give you credit for that. That's for sure. Hypotension, supine hypotension. What else? Hypertension. I'm sorry? High blood pressure. Okay, hypertension, yeah.
Why is that? Why would hypertension reduce? Constriction of the blood vessels will reduce uh, the volume of blood that's being provided to the fetus. Okay, so remember we talked about that that important space there where the placenta and the mother's arteries and vessels meet up. That's a low flow system. It needs to be low flow. So if mother has high blood pressure, that's going to reduce it. Okay, what else? What would else would a, reduce it? Would a partially okay. detached placenta? Okay, all right. An abrupted placenta, okay. That's more high risk stuff, but okay. What um, else is going to reduce? Obesity, if you have a uh, fatty arteries, clogs, then that could Okay, uh, okay. What else? Smoking. Nicotine. What happens with nicotine? It stops the baby from breathing. No, it's not. Basal not constrictor. Baby. Yeah, constricts yeah, blood vessels. Yeah, it restricts yeah. blood vessels. It constricts them, actually. It constricts them, just like high blood pressure. What else? There's one more important aspect. What else? Poor nutrition. We're talking about, uh, yes, it's true. Babies are smaller with poor nutrition, but we're talking about what's restricting blood flow. Wouldn't hypovolemia? Um, Hypo, well, that, well, that's what I was looking for. Hypovolemia. In other words, she doesn't have much blood, right? Blood loss. Anemia. Okay, good. And then the last two slides up here are talking about the hormones again. Um, and it's just depictions. You don't have to memorize these. But I did want you to look in particular at this one right here. So we have progesterone and estradiol, which is estrogen. You notice how during the pregnancy, it goes up, right? And then, it, and then you notice that it drops down at the end. You can't really see the end of the PowerPoint. But... Uh, so those hormones, it's really important that they are high because they have jobs to do, right? And then the last one is talking about the HCG again and the HCS. So um, most importantly is this little box right here, the urine test for pregnancy. If there can be a false positive, if you have a client that's taking anticonvulsants like uh, valproic acid, which she shouldn't be on that during pregnancy anyway, um, Keppra uh, can cause a false positive pregnancy test, uh, some kind of tranquilizer uh, or sedative. False negative, in other words, she does her test and it says it's negative when she's actually pregnant could occur if she's on a diuretic or she's on promethazine or phenergan. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about the maternal changes during pregnancy. Um, do you want to take like a 10 minute break? Okay. So let's meet back again at, um, let's say 15 after the hour. I have one minute after the hour. So let's say 15 minutes after the hour. We'll take a quick break.
Okay, so just a short, a few minutes on nutrition in pregnancy. You noticed probably on your quiz, uh, there was one about folic acid. Folic acid or folate is a B vitamin and it is really important um, to have um, on board even before a woman gets pregnant. I, I've always recommended uh, my clients to be on prenatal vitamins if they're in the uh, living in the reproductive age, right? I mean, the reproductive um, ages. So anywhere certain years 12 to 50, at least be on some folic acid in case uh, she gets pregnant. Um, folic acid is, is that B vitamin that is required for good neurological development of the fetus, of the embryo, actually. Because remember, it's organogenesis during those first eight weeks when all the parts are being put in place and adequate levels of folate is important for neurological development. So if you pick out a vitamin and it says prenatal, there will be at least 400 micrograms, which is needed on a daily basis. So you could look at that. I'm not going to talk about that. So uh, nutrient needs during pregnancy. Just a few more calories a day. Um, the, the majority of calories should be from carbohydrates. Uh, pregnancy is not a time to diet. Uh, a woman in, in, who's pregnant needs 175 um, uh, grams of uh, carbohydrates on a daily basis. It sounds like a lot, but uh, carbohydrates are the energy source uh, for the placenta and the fetus. Uh, protein, about 30%. You don't have to memorize that. Um, so about 300 more calories, three to 400 more calories a day. Uh, weight gain, uh, minimum 11 pounds. Uh, make sure you know the BMI uh, for your test, how to calculate a BMI. Um, pattern of weight gain. One, uh, two to four pounds during the first trimester. So through week uh, 12 and 13, before she goes into her second trimesters, we do like to see some weight gain. Now, <laughs> some women really have trouble with a lot of nausea and they might actually lose weight during that first trimester. So these women, we have to just make sure their uh, nausea is being controlled so that they can consume some calories. Uh, and we have to look at their nutrition, what they're eating. So they really need some good guidance. Uh, what kind of a, a diet would you recommend to a woman who's having trouble with nausea? What are some things you can teach her? Eat, mm -hmm. eat bland foods, stay away from spicy foods. You so know, bland high food in fat. Food. Okay, not high in fat because the fat. Or stay away from high in fat. Yeah, right, right. So fat makes you sick to your stomach, okay? So bland foods like potatoes, uh, preferably a baked potato or a boiled potato, potato with uh, maybe salt on it. Uh, butter tends to be greasy and makes you sick. Um, she can choose something else to put with her potato, some cheese. Uh, rice. Rice is bland, but it's loaded with calories and carbohydrates, and it's a great source of energy. Uh, rice is a complex carbohydrate. In other words, it, it's, it, it, it uh, maintains glucose levels at a nice steady state. It's a good food choice uh, for pregnancy. Pasta is another. Uh, crackers at the bedside uh, when she wakes up in the morning. What other things can we teach her? What uh, if the crackers would like a peanut butter cracker? Would that be okay? Because I know it's protein in the peanut butter, but it can be greasy a little bit. Yeah, that might work too. Uh huh. Yeah. You Good. can encourage her to eat several small meals during the day. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So several meals throughout the day, small portions. Because remember, the stomach is slowing down. So just keeping something in her stomach, but 
Uh, not letting her stomach get empty is another thing that kind of helps prevent nausea. Okay. One thing I re recommend if a woman has history of reflux, a lot of indigestion, that she not drink carbonated beverages, um, especially in the evening time. Uh, actually not drinking a whole lot of fluid in the evening time because then it sits in the stomach and it tends to slosh around. Okay. So um, then for the second and third trimesters, half a pound, pound a week, pound and a half. It depends, you know, where they are. If they're normal weight, about a pound, a normal weight, about a pound per week. Um, re, you know, we don't we don't tell them cut back on your carbs, cut back on your fats, uh, cut back on your salt. We don't teach any of that during for pregnancy. Um, of course, any excess amount is a different story. Um, so they might need referral to a nutritionist if they're obese um, or if they're underweight, if they're an adolescent, um, they might need a referral to someone uh, they can talk, a dietitian. This is just a list, don't have to memorize this, of where the weight is going in a pregnancy. You know, fetus, uh, fat stores, a woman will build fat stores during pregnancy. Um, blood volume, extra vascular volume, breast, uh, the placenta itself weighs a pound and a half. So that's where all the weight comes from. So if you have a client that's not gaining any weight, then she's losing weight. Okay. And really it's not only her fetus that might suffer, it's her herself. Now, this is a really small print. I think I added this after the fact um, when I uploaded it. But this is just a list about um, the dietary portions. And, and I, what I want to bring out in all of this is um, safe foods in pregnancy. There is a group of foods that we want to restrict during pregnancy. So it's any fish that's a large fish. In other words, the amount of mercury is large. So that would be like shark, swordfish, king mackerel, tilefish. I don't eat any of those anyway. But if you have a client that lives in a culture where they eat a lot of fish, like Japan or any of the island uh, countries, um, they do consume more fish than a larger continent because it's a ready resource. So those particular cultures need some guidance. Um, uh, but shrimp and salmon, catfish, canned light tuna, those are all safe, but they even recommend with those that they limit their intake at once or maybe twice a week, okay? So keep that in mind um, when you consider all of the aspects of a woman's lifestyle, you know, her ethnicity, her culture, um, what, you know, typical things they eat. And this is one food group that we have to be careful about. Another thing I want to mention is that deli food. Um, you can go get some sliced ham or some sliced roast beef. And sometimes that roast beef is still pink in the middle. Um, that meat for a pregnant woman needs to be put in the microwave before she eats it. It needs to be completely cooked. No rare meat at all uh, because it can carry listeria. Uh, most of the time, we don't have too much trouble with that, but in pregnancy, it could be very detrimental. So we do recommend um, microwaving deli uh, meats. And certainly no raw fish, no sushi. <laughs> I love sushi. Okay. So you have, this is a case here. Um, you're teaching um, about, um, let's see, wait a minute, let's see. You have a 29-year-old 29, 29 who's pregnant for the first time, G1, Para-1, at 28 weeks of gestation. She's really not a Para-1. If this is her first pregnancy, it would be a zero. Anyway, and you're teaching her in prenatal class, and she's 12 weeks along. Um, everything has been uh, normal. Uh, all her lab that we've been doing, uh, but her pregnancy was not planned. Uh, they are delighted, and they're going to get married in two weeks. Um, she had a pre-pregnancy BMI of 32. 
and it has a history of borderline hypertension. She is being counseled by the physician to gain no more than 15 pounds during pregnancy. Her, as you check her in for a visit, you notice her weight gain is 12 pounds already. And her blood pressure is 138 over 86. She says, what her client says, what am I going to do? I have three more months to go. And she begins to cry. What is your response going to be? What should you say to her? What are some things that you could, the, the answer is not here. What kinds of things could you say to her? I would um, tell her we would set her up with some kind of nutrition plan to help her stay a little more healthy. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you certainly don't want her to go on a diet. So referral is a good thing. And then as a nurse, like uh, Beth, you said, you know, smaller meals throughout the day. So you have knowledge that you can give her some guidance too. Okay. If she doesn't want to go to a nutritionist, you could have her, you could sit down and have her write down what she eating and then evaluate it. Because as a nurse, you know, um, so you could give her some specific guidance. Okay. So what do you know? Some risk factors that are associated with obesity. Other than Just reduced blood flow. Gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes. Yeah. Developing diabetes during the pregnancy. Hmm? Anybody know anything else? It's kind of ahead of where we are right now, but I thought maybe you might know. Uh, hypertension. Uh, high blood pressure, yeah. High, gestational hypertension, yes. It's almost like even if she's not pregnant. So high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all those things. Also, stillborn. Okay, during the antepartum stillborn, preeclampsia, some of those high-risk issues. Good. Um, why do we check for protein in the urine? Does anybody know? When you see protein in the urine, and you have probably haven't you haven't learned this in med surgery, of course not. Preeclampsia, yeah. So protein in the urine is a sign that the kidneys are stressed. Okay, so any client, whether they're pregnant or not, male or female, if there's protein in the urine, it means that the kidneys are not functioning as well as they could be. They're not able to contain the protein. Okay, so you can look at this. Also, um, poor nutrition makes for uh, an unhealthy placenta. Obesity makes for an unhealthy placenta. Underweight makes for an unhealthy placenta. So keep in mind, fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. I don't recommend that women who are pregnant take extra A, D, E, K because it does accumulate. And so it, it's your book doesn't really talk about, I don't think it talks about, but it's not something I would recommend. However, the water-soluble vitamins, she's not going to become toxic because by the end of the day, they're gone. Okay. That's why they're daily vitamins. Pica. Has anybody here ever been anemic so badly that they want to eat ice all the time? Oh, well, not ice, but yeah. Yep. So eating ice or pica is a sign of IDA. What's IDA? Iron yeah. Anemia. Yeah, anemia. Iron deficiency anemia. IDA. So if you if your client says she's hungry for something that normally uh, you would need, like chalk, um, dirt. Okay, that's a sign of, of iron deficiency anemia. What about cornstarch? I know. A lot of people who've done that. Uh -huh. yeah, cornstarch, yeah, yeah. Does it have iron in it? Cornstarch. I don't know if it's the the idea that it has iron. It's just it might be something in it that, uh, for some reason, I don't know. Cornstarch is sweet. I don't know. 
So that's pica, pica, however you want to pronounce it. So baking powder, cornstarch, laundry detergent. Uh. Okay. So as far as nutrition, that is the main um, area that we really have to work with our adolescents on. Because, you know, um, a woman is not really mature until she's 21 years old. Or, yeah, 21 her physiological maturity. So if she's pregnant at the age below that, at 16, then she's still growing. So she really needs um, good nutrition and she might be one to send to a dietitian if, if, if that's what she wants to do. Certainly you're going to keep a closer eye on her, making sure she's gaining weight, talk to her about what she's eating, um, make sure she has access to what she needs and taking prenatal vitamins. But that's what we're concerned about the adolescent group with. Exercise. If a woman was playing tennis before she was pregnant, she can continue playing tennis. Okay. She might get uncomfortable toward the end of her pregnancy. But she can still do it. She needs to exercise. That's good. And then Kegel exercises. What are those? Pelvic floor exercises. That is, that's the pelvic floor muscles. Exercising the pelvic floor muscles. So you're going to teach her to start and stop her urine voluntarily. Those are the muscles that she needs. I think your book goes into great detail. Um, um, women sometimes will experience some. Um, 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 incontinence, uh, like urinary incontinence during pregnancy. And if we get them to do some Kegel exercises, sometimes that'll help. And also Kegel exercises better prepare the pelvic floor for delivery. So if you're exercising muscles, they become more flexible and more elastic. So it's better uh, if he does some Kegel exercises. Uh, during lactation, she's going to need more calories, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, so that's what that was. Let's see. So avoiding um, smoking, nicotine use. So a, a patch is just as bad as smoking, as far as the baby's concerned. Um, alcohol. Um, no alcohol, abstain from alcohol completely. Uh, we don't know how much alcohol uh, will damage a fetus, but we just recommend that all women abstain during pregnancy. Excess caffeine. So no more than 200 milligrams. So that's about two cups of coffee a day. Um, keep in mind, there's caffeine and chocolate and, and um, what else? Uh, carbonated beverages. All those things. Okay. All right, now we're going into genetics a little bit, okay? For someone who wanted, asked me earlier, what chapter are we going into? Um, where is it? Where is my genetics? There it is. Now, as far as genetics, I don't want you to get hung up on it. And I gave you a, a, a I posted a document about genetics to simplify it for you. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what we need to, you need to understand. Okay. Where, I'm having trouble today. Let me stop that.
bear with me as I play with my Okay. The human genome, your book talks about the human genome. And basically it would be like, okay, um, Cheney has certain uh, chromosomes and genes in her body. That's her genome, okay? That's her makeup, okay? So don't get hung up about that. And I've given you websites if you're interested in this. I'm kind of, I, I enjoy reading about it. Um, I don't understand completely, of course. I'm not a geneticist, but it is fascinating to me. So the reason we bring it up is because the way it's passed down in pregnancy, okay? When there's uh, conception occurs, the sperm and the egg bring their particular chromosomes together and unite, and it makes a new genome for that new baby. Okay, so chromosomes and genes provide all the information our body needs to operate. Okay, it guides um, uh, the body's processes. Uh, but we have learned so much in this field and your book goes in to talk a lot about the different things we use genes for um, predicting uh, a predictor test, a, a, um, gene therapy, um, replacing genes. Um, that's certainly beyond the scope of this class. But in, in pregnancy, knowing what, a womb, what genes a woman is carrying that could affect the fetus is important. Um, so let's talk a little bit about genetics before we get started. So this is what we call a karyotype. It's the picture of the autosomes and the sex chromosomes in the human cell. So we're gonna, I'm gonna pick on Shani again. So we're saying, oh, I can't, cause this is a male. Let me pick on Mitchell. This is Mitchell's, what we call karyotype. He's normal. He has a normal number of autosomes. So he has 22 pairs of autosomes. Uh, now, granted, all of these are chromosomes, right? But there's 22 pairs of the autosomes and there's an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, as you can see by the arrow. Those are the sex chromosomes. So that made Mitchell a boy, okay? So that's what his karyotype looks like generally. Okay, so inside each of those autosomes and the sex chromosome are genes that uh, made him who he is today. And here's, here's Shaney's, okay? So same thing, 22 normal pairs of autosomes and, a, and two sex chromosomes that are X's, okay? So it's the Y uh, chromosome that determines the sex of the baby. So normal chromosome amount are 22 pairs plus an XX or an XY, okay? Sometimes uh, one of the, uh, either the sperm or the egg will have an extra chromosome attached and it becomes abnormal. So it's a trisomy. In other words, it's got one of the chromosomes has three legs to it. For example, Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a chromosomal abnormality. It's a trisomy. If you can see in this picture, that autosome number 21 has three legs. So it's called a trisomy. So overall, this client has um, 47 instead of 46. Okay, total, if you count all the chromosomes because they, they're each a pair. In other words, 23 with an X and a Y or an XX would be Down syndrome. So Down syndrome um, is uncommon. 
Uh, but who's at risk for having a baby with Down syndrome? Does anybody know? Women over 35? Yes. Yes. Women who are, have reached the 35 years and get pregnant, the risk for having a Down syndrome baby are increased. Yes. So some typical characteristics that you'll see right at birth. Um, a very flat nasal bridge, very flat nose. Uh, their eyes are slanted and they have a fold right here, right here, the epicanthal folds. They have white spots on their iris and those are called brush field spots. Their palms, they have what's called a simian crease. There's a picture of it there and there's pictures in your book. Their tongues are larger. Okay, and they tend to protrude a little bit. Their ears might be uh, mishappen. And then between the first great toe and the second toe, it's got a space. So there's some common uh, manifestation of Down syndrome. Now, there are situations where um, that number of chromosomes might not be in every cell of the body. In other words, you could have just a few characteristics of Down syndrome and not be as severely affected. And then it's the opposite. Every single cell is affected in the body. So you're severely affected. And they have other problems. And it's usually like heart problems. Um, they tend not to live as long. Okay. They, they tend to have a, a webbed neck and a flat head. Intellectually, uh, intellectually, they might be smart, but it's their judgment. Emotional and judgment issues come to play. So this, the abnormal sex chromosome, so all the regular autosomes, 1 through 22, could be normal. But either their X or their Y is abnormal. For example, Turner syndrome in females, they have... Um, a missing chromosome. So they're considered a monosomy. They only have one X chromosome, not two X's. Okay, so these women are short, whoops, sexual immaturity, neck webbing, and some infertility. And there's a picture up there on top. Kleinfelter syndrome, I don't have a picture of it up. It's a chrysomy because Kleinfelter has an extra X sex chromosome. So Kleinfelter is 22 plus XXY. So Kleinfelter men are taller. They tend to be infertile, small testes, small penis, poor muscle tone, poor language development. Okay, nothing about cognition really with either one of these. So I think I had the, these are the karyotypes then for Turner, which is a monosomy, and for Kleinfelter, which is a trisomy. And you can see why. The monosomy female with Turner only has one X chromosome instead of two. And then on the right, Kleinfelter has two Xs and a Y. So you can see why a man with Kleinfelters would be a little effeminate, okay? Um, metabolism like a woman. Some characteristics like a woman. And then, so the genes, let's switch to now inside the chromosome, the genes, we've got so many of them. Everybody has so many genes, but there are certain genes that we wanna know about. So in particular for pregnancy, routine carrier screening. In other words, I'm gonna draw Shani's blood because she came into my office and she's pregnant. And I'm gonna draw her blood to see if she is carrying any abnormal genes. Is she, does she have a gene for cystic fibrosis? Or does she have a gene for sickle cell? A gene maybe for phenylketonuria, a gene for galactosemia. So it could be any of these disorders. And so this group is called autosomal recessive genes. Okay. In other words, Sherry might be carrying the gene, but if her partner is not carrying the gene, then there's not a problem. 
But if she's carrying the gene for cystic fibrosis and her partner is also carrying the gene for cystic fibrosis, it doesn't mean they have the disease, okay? They just have the gene for the disease, okay? So if they both have it, then there's a one in four chance that their baby is going to have cystic fibrosis, okay? And that's what we mean by recessive. Okay, there's only a one in four chance that one of their children are going to be infected. Two of their children have a risk of actually carrying the gene. And one child, one out of four, not going to either have the gene nor have the disease. Okay, so this is autosomal. So the only thing you need to remember is that it's a, it's a carrier screening for abnormal genes. And in pregnancy, we're looking at cystic fibrosis sickle cell, and then we also look at SMA, skeletal muscular atrophy. They actually located the gene for SMA. So we can test for that too. So if there's a strong a family history. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have a question. Yeah. Would, would it um, factor X be in that, in this also, in this screening? Uh, factor X, you mean factor uh, X, um, fragile X? Fragile X, factor X. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have it in this one. Um, it's a sex, I think that's a sex chromosome disorder. Um, I might be in the dominant. I can't remember. No. Um, but fragile X is a disorder. Yeah, it is a genetic disorder that's passed on. And I'm thinking it's a sex chromosome disorder. Fragile X and Fragile X has all kinds of things attached to it, and you could have part of it or not all of it. So, what do you know about Factor X or Fragile X? Uh, um, so, when I was pregnant with my kids, um, I actually got it. I, I did the carrier screening, and I actually came back positive with it. And what okay. they had explained to me was something similar to what you said with the cystic fibrosis, but that, for example, I, I carry it and I can go ahead and try. And like, if I, if I was to marry someone or the father was to also carry it, then it would pass on to the kid. And then if the kids carry it and he um, has a baby with a female that carries it, their child could have aut uh, autism. Okay. From what okay. they explained to me. So Yeah. So the idea is that both parents have to carry that abnormal gene. So carrier screening, Sheila, thank you so much for, for Shayla. Sh thank you for sharing that, that, that example. That's excellent. Yes. So any, in just like in um, breast cancer, if there's a strong fit family history of breast cancer, we test for the BRCA gene. OK, so if a, a person has a BRCA gene, then there's an increased risk of breast cancer. OK, so that's that's what we call carrier screening. All right. So autosomal recessive, sickle cell and cystic fibrosis. So there's a there's a dominant inheritance too. certain genes are dominant. So if you have a dominant gene. Let's say fragile X was dominant and Sheila had that. And it doesn't matter whether her partner has it or not. Okay. 50% of her children could have fragile X if it's, it's not dominant though. Okay. So Marfan syndrome and Von Willebrand, uh, which is a um, uh, bleeding disorder. Uh, and then all these other diseases listed here. So a dominance means that 50% of the children are at risk for, for carrying the disease or having the disease itself. And the other 50% would be carrying the gene. Okay. And of course, we know that fetal development is not only affected by the genetic makeup of the parents, but about environmental issues and medications mother is taking, right? Substances she might use, um, neural tube defect, uh, pyro, uh, pyloric stenosis, um, cleft lip and palate, um, 
congenital heart disease often found with diabetics. So it's not only our genetic makeup that affects the development of a baby, but also the environment. So can anything my... in, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, can you check my message I sent you through uh, Zoom, please? In the I chat? Yes, please. You can talk to me if you want to. So I have somebody uh, in my, in the program with me right now she's taking the class with roberts which you said you're covering for them tonight yeah she wanted me to ask you if you're still doing the five to eight because that's the time their class is 5 30 to eight o'clock uh she said that they said five to eight for their class i'm not really sure that's why i wanted to No, it's at 5 30 as soon as this class is over then i'll i'll start with that group okay thank you okay <laughs> All right, so uh, the term teratogen or teratogen, however you want to pronounce it, are substances that are damaging to a fetus. So it could be uh, chemicals, um, a pollution, um, infections, radiation, any of those things, uh, chronic illnesses, drugs, uh, teratogens then are just the substances that um, will damage a fetus. That's what we call it. I don't think you're asked. You're not going to be asked that on, a, on one of the exams. So let's talk about fertilization. And we've talked about the chromosomes. So you see go, on the left side of this picture, you have an egg with 22 autosomes, right? And a chromosome, a sex chromosome. They only have half of what a human needs because it's just an egg, right? Normally there would be 22 pairs and an XX, right? But since it's just an egg, she has half and the sperm has his half. So the sperm is what determines the sex, right? So you could have a sperm with 22 autosomes and one Y or a sperm with 22 autosomes and an X, okay? It's an egg. It's the male form of an egg. So when they combine and become a zygote, then you have the 44 chromosomes and the XX or the XY. Okay, so one's a female, one's a male. And that's called a zygote. So the eggs are called gametes, right? And the concepsis is called a zygote. So fertilization occurs in this picture. I'll give you a minute to find it, it's right here. So this, the egg is released at ovulation about midway in the cycle and fertilization occurs and normally only one sperm can penetrate. Every once in a while, if they do it simultaneously, two can get in there and make twins, right? So fertilization occurs in this outer third of the fallopian tube, okay? And it becomes a zygote. And then it begins to grow and multiply. And usually by the sixth, your text says day seven is usually the earliest that it actually implants inside the uterus. So it's pulled through the tube, there's a current. And it becomes a blastocyst when it enters the uterus. And it actually implants as a blastocyst in the thick endometrial layer that the progesterone has made. So it's all this engorgement of blood. So it could be on the from the right ovary or the left ovary. Or it could be both, and you have fraternal twins. If the egg had two sperm inside, it's going to split and become identical twins. So embryology uh, or is when organogenesis occurs. So genesis means... Genesis means beginning, right? So organogenesis is the beginning of organ development, like the brain, 
the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, and such. Um, usually, if we do an ultrasound, we can see a gestational sign usually as early as five weeks into the pregnancy, not much before that. Okay. The heart is beating, but we just can't see it even with an ultrasound. Okay. Um, at three weeks. Um, usually by seven weeks, we can see everything as far as the whole fetus and the heart beating between six and seven weeks. Now, there might be occasions when it's a little before that, uh, but usually six, seven or eight weeks, we can see the heart beating, we can see the blood flow in the, in the uh, embryo, okay? We can actually hear the heart beating with a, with a Doppler on the mother's belly, not much before, if at all, nine weeks. Okay, nine weeks. I've heard it at nine weeks. My client was um, normal weight, and I was able to hear it at nine weeks, um, heart beating. The ultrasound can also measure that um, embryo. Uh, usually it's a fetus by the time we can measure it. Um, so crown to rump length, it measures the top of the, the embryo's head to the, the butt. And that length correlates with the gestational age. So if we have a client that doesn't know when she got pregnant, doesn't remember her last period, then we can um, date her pregnancy with an ultrasound. And then beginning nine weeks, our baby is now a fetus. Okay, this is just a, a, an ultrasound picture of a pregnancy at six or seven weeks. And you can see the embryo. You can see the, the, the sac, which is the dark part. And the yolk sac is still there. Okay. So at nine weeks, then we have our uh, fetus and amniotic fluid has been developing already. Okay, so let's talk about the parts of the components of a pregnancy, um, not mother, but the baby. So we're talking about the uh, placenta, the amniotic fluid, the umbilical cord itself. Okay, so a baby needs fluid around it to keep it buoyant, to allow it to grow and move. And so the cord can float freely, right? Amniotic fluid is made from the mother's um, serum initially, okay? And then around nine weeks, um, the fetal lungs and the fetal urine, probably before nine weeks, the urine is beginning to be produced already and that is what adds to amniotic fluid volume. Okay, so it's a shock absorbing um, liquid. It helps keep that baby in that ambient temperature. Um, it has some immunoglobulins in it. Um, we're concerned if we can measure the amount of amniotic fluid with an ultrasound. So anything less than 300 is a problem. Okay. And then anything more than 2000 is considered polyhydramnios. So we talked about the placenta, how much I've stressed it. <laughs> so here's some more pictures about the importance of the placenta. What is it doing? It's providing exchange. So it's called the exchange organ. It's a temporary organ, right? It goes away at the end of the pregnancy, okay? So it's not really mature until about 12 weeks into the pregnancy. So it provides exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide of nutrients and waste products back and forth in the intervillous space right here. Okay, so you have the, um, the mother's side right here, the endometrial vein, which comes off the iliac artery and vein, okay? And it's feeding the placenta. And the placenta then provides the blood flow to the fetal side. The umbilical vein is what carries the oxygenated blood, okay? 
So it's reversed. And the umbilical arteries removes waste product and carbon dioxide from fetal blood, returns it back to the placenta, to the mother's blood to be reoxygenated. So you can see how important blood flow to that placenta is. Placenta produces progesterone and estrogen. And the, um, uh, the human chorionic somatotropin, so uh, somatomammatropin, okay, for, blood, for breast growth. So the placenta is dependent upon adequate uterine blood flow and blood pressure. So if mother's in a bad position and reduces her blood flow, if she has low blood pressure or low blood volume, during a contraction, the blood flow is reduced. And then the umbilical cord. The only purpose of the umbilical cord is to be a chamber for the blood vessels that travel between the placenta and the fetus. It doesn't have any other function than that. No exchange of anything. Okay, it just cushions the blood vessels. It's got Wharton's jelly around it, and that protects them and keeps them moist. Fetal circulation. Uh, don't get caught up in fetal circulation. Um, fetal circulation is different. Why is it different than adult circulation, heart circulation? What is the underlying cause or the need for it to be different? What do you think? Because they're not breathing in the womb. Yeah, lungs are non-functional. We don't need the lungs. The fetus doesn't need the lungs because the baby's receiving oxygenated blood from mother, okay? So there's no lungs. The lungs are being perfused a little bit, but not much, okay? And that's the di one di major difference. And, and that is the difference why it, it, it circulates differently because we're the blood is being shunted away from the lungs, okay? So you have like three different shunts here. You have the shunt that comes in, the umbilical cord directly into the fetus, and it comes and it, some of it bypasses the liver. That's the first one. And then it comes into the uh, right atrium and most of the blood bypasses the right ventricle. And it goes through the foramen ovale into the left ventricle, which is right here. Okay, and then out down and out through the aorta. And then the blood coming from the Vena cava then goes to the right ventricle. It's a smaller amount, and it goes to the pulmonary artery, but it bypasses the lungs. So there's three shunts. Just remember, the lungs are not functional, so the lungs are bypassed. So there's a lot of di it's different because we can bypass things. Okay. So question. You just delivered a baby. You're excited. You're in nursing school and you're on the labor and delivery unit and you got to see a baby being delivered. Um, after one minute, the cord was clamped and then it was cut. And you looked at the end of the umbilical cord and you saw what? Cut end. What do you see? Two vessels? Three vessels? Three. Four vessels? Three vessels. Two arteries in one vein. Who all agrees? Yes. Everybody should agree. That's right. So one big art, one big vein, sorry, and two little arteries. Okay. Sometimes there's only uh, one each, a two vessel cord, one artery in one vein. That does happen. 
Um, sometimes it's a problem, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it might be an indication there's other problems, but it's kind of rare, but I have seen it. So how would you respond to your client if she asked you, how does a baby breathe and all that fluid? And don't tell me they have a snorkel. <laughs> how would you respond? They're not breathing. The lungs aren't working. <laughs> they kind of practice breathe, but no. not no, breathing. Confusion like takes place in the blood. So what would you say to your client? That oxygen is being delivered directly to the baby through the uh, placenta. All right. Yeah. Yes. They don't need to breathe. All right. True or false? And I already have the answers here. Um, placenta is a temporary organ. It does sure. begin to calcify late in the pregnancy, really late. So that's why it's not good for a client or client to deliver beyond. 41 weeks. And yes, it's dependent upon uterine blood flow. It doesn't connect to the mother's blood vessels. Uh, it's a low pressure system right in there. And it doesn't really filter out toxins or alcohol. Alcohol passes easily into the placenta. So do the toxins. Okay. All right. Got a few more minutes before my next class starts. Let's see. Can I ask a question about the quiz? Yep. So under Canvas, under mine, it says there's two quiz ones and one's missing. If you look in the module, so. Yeah, yeah, it's the module, the quiz and the modules. If you're looking on your phone and you're in your Canvas on your phone, you can't, you have to go to the modules to see what your assignments are. Yeah, so no, I mean, under, I am on, on my computer under grades is what I'm saying. There's yeah, on grades, yeah. Okay, it does yeah, that. Okay, yeah. I was just making sure I didn't. Right, miss right. Okay, thank yeah. you. That's yeah. not going to affect a grade though, is it? No, it, no, 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 no. It actually no, no. says missing in red or it's not it's not a published okay there's one um I actually did both because since i saw it missing yeah, I mean, and i didn't want to get in trouble i was like <laughs> oops how did you do both of them how did you do both of them i don't know the first one, you know how you said that the first one, um, it should have had something about folic acid. It did not. It there were questions that weren't even relevant to the chapter. There was a question there that um had said, um, I'm sorry, let me lower my ATV. My son is here. Um, there was a question that had said, um uh will you pass if you have a 78 percent in the class? A syllabus question uh-huh a syllabus question and i'm like wait if you do all your homework or something like that and i'm like what <laughs> so then yeah it said if you uh have at least a 78 on your kgas um and you turn in some of your homework will you pass mm -hmm. is that the, the one you took was false on that one that's the one I took also. That was the only one that's I saw. One I that's the one I took as well. Yep. Professor mm -hmm. Zeller. Same here. They're actually both published in our grades list in the in Canvas. Yeah, we all took that there same two one. Quiz and that's the one that's under modules is the one with the 78% question on it. Okay. For example, but in mine, it says missing, so I clicked on it, and it would allow me to take it again if I pressed start, which I did not do. 
That's what I did. And I actually did it. And it was more relevant to what we actually um, spoke in class and to what we had studied during the week. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you know, if we could keep that grade, that would be a lot better. <laughs> Okay, hang on just a minute. I'll look at it. Because um, you should have only had access to one. That's why you're supposed to go through your modules, not your grades, to get to it. I it actually not have been do, in your module. It, I went through the module, module, and that's the one he gave me was the one with the seventy-eight percent question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was yeah. in my module. Yeah, it was in my modules. Yeah, it's the one I did too. And then when I checked my grade, my grade book, um, I saw that that there was a missing quiz and then I was like wait what what do you mean I just took the quiz and I clicked on the one that said missing and don't worry about don't different. worry about what you see in the grades as far as quizzes and stuff it's the modules that have the real information okay um At first, we all went through the module quiz because you gave us a password. But the other one that's listed in the grades, you don't need a password. You can just click on yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah, that's not the one you should have taken then. OK. Gotcha. Now I know what and I need. Also do. like that for quiz two also. Oh, oh um, in our grades, there's two quiz twos. Good eye. Okay. All right. This um, got a, another PowerPoint I want to share with you. So you need to know units of measure. These are the things that you need to know. So make sure you review these. Um, rounding, you need to know how to round. A lot of students will miss a math question. They do all the perfect calculation, but then they forget to round. So they miss the question, okay? What does a bolus mean? It's a it's the amount of medication given in a shorter amount of time. It's a larger amount because we want to get it into the system. So we give it over a short period of time. In the OB calculation, some of you misunderstood that. Uh, the first question was about uh, the flow rate to get, get uh, medication in in 30 minutes. So you're going to set it up on a pump and set it up for an hourly rate. So you have to double it, okay? But then like heparin, we don't do it in fusion. So a heparin do, um, bolus of 7,200 units, we're either going to give it subcutaneously 7,200 units because you, you pull it out of a syringe or give it IV push, okay? We don't give it by the hour on a, on a, in infusion, okay? So that's the difference between the two. And then there is one on magnesium. Magnesium is also set up as an infusion over 30 minutes. Okay, so that's what that means. So usually like heparin, we give a bolus and then we give it to them continuously at a lower dose continuously. So the, the um, 1,500 units every hour is set on a pump and a different solution. Okay, has it's that own solution. The the term gravid means um, pregnancy, right? 
It means pregnancy. So noli means none. Primi means the first. And multi means two or more. So if you have a prima gravida, it means a woman that's pregnant for the first time. A nulla gravida would be a woman who's never been pregnant. And then a multi gravida, she's been pregnant two or more times. Dr. Zeller? Yes. Where can we find this PowerPoint? This is found in week two announcement. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. If you look in the announcements, like, like I told you last week, announcements are very important. Every week, I'll put announcement in that says week two announcement, and it's got all kinds of stuff in it. Okay, that's where I put everything. If something's missing, I do need to know. If you can't access it, I need to know. So everything, there's videos in there. If you're not having trouble accessing the videos, I need to know. I don't know because I can access them, but the way I posted it, I might have to redo it. A parody then is a pregnancy that was delivered after the 20th week gestation. Okay. What do we call a pregnancy delivered before the 20th week gestation between weeks one and 20? What do we call that pregnancy? Preterm. Miscarriage or abortion? Miscarriage. Yeah, miscarriage or abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, miscarriage or abortion. Good. So a prima para means a woman who's pregnant and has delivered her first baby that survived past 20 weeks. Now, she might have been pregnant three times before, but she wasn't able to carry them to the 20th week. She had three abortions, okay, whether it's induced or spontaneous, okay, a prima para. A multiparia para is a woman who has delivered two pregnancies that went beyond that 20 weeks. So the term viability means, do we have an embryo or a fetus that's viable? Usually it's 22 to 25 weeks, the age of viability. In other words, the ability of that fetus to live beyond the uterus, outside of the uterus, okay? So a preterm baby, extremely preterm at 20 weeks, right? But any baby delivered between 20 weeks then and 36 weeks and six days is considered a preterm baby. A baby delivered 37 weeks to 41 weeks and six days in that time span is considered a full-term baby or a term baby. And then a baby delivered at 42 weeks and later is considered post-term and they're high risk. There's no hardly any amniotic fluid anymore. The sun is getting old. All kinds of problems with post-term. So then we have a way of categorizing a woman's pregnancies. Uh, now, you have a, uh, a practice sheet I posted for you, uh, some examples of how to do this. So we ask a client, how many times have you been pregnant? No matter what the outcome was, whether it was a miscarriage, an abortion, or full term or preterm, how many times have you conceived? And that's the G. So what we'll end up is with five, five numbers. Okay, the number of G, the number of T, okay? Uh, some of you are signing are off. We... Heather, it's okay. Some of you are signing on for the 530 class, that's fine. Um, Dr. Roberts class. So you just hang on, okay? And uh, you can gain information while you're waiting for class to start, or you can just turn your camera off and just sit there.
doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So a full term uh, would be how many times she's delivered baby. Uh, the, the T would be how many deliveries uh, has she had a baby delivered after 20 weeks. I'm sorry, after 36, six weeks. So week 37 and, to, and on. A preterm then the P would be how many babies has she delivered after 20 weeks, but before 37. Uh, uh, Melissa, I wanted to let you know too, this is um, my three o'clock class and I will be teaching Dr. Roberts class in a few minutes. So you're welcome to stay on and just uh, listen and we'll get started with the second class in a little bit. Um, and then a would be the number of abortions. You have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I was in the wrong class. <laughs> Which class are you supposed to? Are you Ms. Dr. Roberts student? Yeah, I didn't know. You're in the right class. Is this like the morning class that I just interrupted? You, you're fine. You're fine. You're just a few minutes early. You're, oh, you're in the okay. right place. Yeah, you're in the right place. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we don't start until 530. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she just That's okay. The in the email she sent us on Canvas, it just says the, it just, she just gave us the, the number to connect to the Zoom meeting, but it didn't say 5.30. Yeah, 5.30 is when the class starts. Thank you for letting me know. You're welcome, <laughs> it's okay. All right, so learning how to categorize your, your client um, is one thing that you know, you have to know how to do. And we are running on, short on time, but um, there's a video about this and there's a picture thing about this so you can practice, okay? And then the Nagel's rule, understanding uh, how we um, uh, estimate a due date, okay? So we take the first day of her last menstrual period, okay? So go back three months, add 70 days, and then add a year. So June okay. 21st, somebody want to work with that? Go through that with me. So her first day of her last menstrual period was June 21st. So the first thing we do is go back three months, which would be what? March, March. I can't change it, March. March 21st, 2021. Now we need to add seven days. So March 28th, and then add a year. So March 28th, 2022 is her due date. So that's what we call Nagel's rule. Okay. Presumptive signs of pregnancy. Those are the signs or the symptoms Okay, so these are subjective, right? This is what your client, this is what Shani is telling me. She come to the office and she's feeling tired. She's actually felt the baby move. Uh, she's been nauseous. Her breasts are tender and she missed her period. So those are presumptive symptoms of pregnancy, okay? And then we can tell our client that she probably is pregnant by the things that we observe as clinicians. So some things that we can say probable signs of pregnancy would be the positive pregnancy test. Remember, it can be a false positive, right? So it's really probably she's pregnant. Um, Chadwick sign, Goodell sign. Chadwick is a little tint, blue tint of the cervix and the vaginal walls. Goodell is actual softening of those areas. Hagar sign causes the uterus to anti-flex. In other words, that lower uterine segment is soft. Blotma 
usually you do this a little bit later in pregnancy, but it's just a vibration. If I tap up on the cervix, I might feel a vibration of a fetus. And those are all probable signs. Braxton Hicks is another probable sign. Braxton Hicks are false contractions. They go away if mom gets up and walks around. The only way we can tell our client for sure that she's pregnant, a positive sign of pregnancy is if we see the baby or if we hear a fetal heart tone. And then lastly, if I put my hands on her belly and I can feel the baby move, I can tell her she's pregnant, okay? So those are the positive signs. You definitely need to know presumptive, probable, and positive. And here they are again. So the top of the uterus is the muscle, the strong part of the uterus. We call it the fundus, okay? Um, we can palpate it beginning around 12 weeks. And usually around 20 weeks, it's at, at the umbilicus, the belly button, around 20 weeks. And then we can begin to measure with our tape measure, right? Measure from the pubic bone to the fundus. And once it reaches that 20th week and we're above it, how many centimeters above the umbilicus are, are you measuring the fundus? That'll correlate with the gestational weeks. So if I uh, measure my fundus at 24 centimeters, that means she's 24 weeks pregnant, approximately, okay? If your client smokes or has nicotine in their system, it might be smaller. Or if she uses substances or she's an adolescent, it might be smaller. We talked about the aortocaval syndrome, hypo, uh, the uh, supine hypotension. And here's just another picture of that. And then another test we do in pregnancy, besides a carrier screening, this is, we draw from the mother's blood, this test, and it's beyond 11 weeks. And this is test tell us if there's a risk for Down syndrome or neural tube defects. Okay, so this is, uh, and we call this the AFP test. That should have been on your quiz today. The AFP test. <laughs> Okay, so with Down syndrome, the AFP levels are going to be down. They're going to be low. Right here. You can see that first column. That's all you have to know. With neural tube defects, you can see it right here, like mm -hmm. spina bifida, mm -hmm. the AFP levels right are going to be higher. I don't understand. Okay, those are the two that you need to know. So Down syndrome, AFP is down. Neural tube defects, the mm -hmm. AFP is going to be higher. In mother's blood, Ms. Ella? Yes. Uh, is this the 530 class? Is this Ms. Roberts' class? Almost. Almost. Oh, am I early? <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. Okay. I was just so scared. I thought I had missed the class and missed the kids. <laughs> I was confused too. I guess I came a little okay. early. I came early. That's okay. okay. We'll, we'll wait till 5 30 okay. to continue. I'm sorry. You're right. You are all right. Okay. So we are running out of time here. Um, and then ABO incompatibility and Leopold maneuvers. So you can go go over those last couple slides on your own. Um, that was That's a really good PowerPoint to study, okay? And th there was another one, and I haven't had time to go over it, but make sure you access all those documents in the week two announcements, okay? Because they have really good information, and that way you're not spending hours and hours reading your book about stuff that you really don't need to know. Use what I give you to guide your reading and your text. Okay, okay. because what I make, the, all, the, the PowerPoints I make come from the book, okay, because that's where your tests come from, all right? All right. Are we going to get the same slides? <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I hope it all is. right. Anybody in my class have any questions? Next week, are we going to have a, a quiz or an exam? Next mm -hmm. week is your quiz, according to your syllabus and according to the modules. Another quiz. I'm going to make sure you have the right quiz. I'm going to get rid of that other one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is crazy. Just, okay. just make sure it's the, like. I will make, one. I'll be fair. I will be fair. So I'll be fair. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, Bye Shayla. Bye, everybody. Have Bye, a Dora. great night. You have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to stop recording so I can restart it. <laughs>